Everyone is looking for answers. Answers to both the common and the complicated matters of life. Thankfully, the real answers to all of life's questions are found in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible is the key that unlocks these answers, providing real solutions for this life and the life to come. As you join us today, you'll discover real answers to life's most pressing questions. And you, along with us, can rejoice in the Lord. Take your Bible, if you would, and join me today in Psalm 119, Psalm 119. And today we continue on with a series that we began last week, really asking a question, where are you headed? Where are you headed? Now, I grew up in Michigan, and so in Michigan, obviously, we get snow, and you have to learn to drive in the snow in Michigan. That's just part of the deal. So if you're gonna drive in Michigan, you you need to figure out how to drive in the white stuff that's gonna cover the ground. Now, just out of curiosity, and since it's only us in here today, how many of you learned to drive in snow by, by finding a vacant church parking lot? You were doing it for good purposes. You were practicing learning how to drive and how many of you've ever you know found a church parking lot and done donuts in the church parking lot <laughs> figuring out okay so a lot of you so i'm not recommending this this is not an endorsement but it is part of driver's ed in michigan okay well there's a lot to learn i i mean you can learn how to drive in snow and there is something to learn about counter steering and and how fast you you should not try to take a curve or a corner going through a stoplight, how soon you have to start slowing down before you actually get to the light or the the stop sign. There's a lot of things to learn about driving in the snow. And you can learn how to drive in the snow. But there's also something in Michigan or, or in the north that you really can't learn how to drive in, and that's the ice. There really is no driving on ice, it, it will not allow you to counter steer or to take some kind of, of special measures. You have at that moment lost control. Snow is sometimes even enjoyable or fun to drive in, if, if not you know, somewhat challenging, but, but ice is dangerous to drive on. There's just no controlling it. In fact, some years ago, my, my mom lost her sister, my aunt and and my aunt's daughter, my cousin. I can remember my mom was here visiting in Pensacola. Julie and I lived here then and and we got a call that that an accident had taken place and they were simply driving in Michigan winter. They hit a patch of what sometimes we refer to as black ice and their car slid out of control and, and it struck a large vehicle that was coming towards them and they lost their lives. All that to say that there is some control you can have on snow, but, but not on ice. You may actually have found yourself at times, if you've driven in those kinds of situations where you intended, you thought, I'm, I'm heading forward and, and all of a sudden your world begins to what we sometimes refer to as spin out of control. And while you, you were at one moment going forward, the next moment you're going backwards and, and you know this is not the way it is supposed to be. Sometimes life takes on some of those same characteristics that there are challenging circumstances, there are things that we face in life that that we can learn to navigate. And and yet at times it seems as if we have hit something, some patch of life, some stretch that has caught us unawares. And life seems to spin out of control. You know, we're asking the question, where are you headed? And the title of our message today is really a one-word title. It's not that we desire to go this direction. It's not even that we necessarily planned to go this direction, but we find that we are backwards. We're going in a direction in our lives that, that is consequential 
dangerous. There are things now that begin to approach us that we have what we feel like no control over. Our Bibles are open right now to the the book of Psalm chapter 119. C.H. Spurgeon wrote of this psalm, the more one studies it, the fresher it becomes. This psalm becomes the more full and fascinating, the oftener you turn to it. It contains no idle word. The grapes of the cluster are almost bursting full with the new wine of the kingdom. The more you look into this mirror of a gracious heart, the more you will see in it. He also wrote, we believe that David wrote this psalm. It is Davidic in tone and expression. It tallies with David's experience in many interesting points. I agree that that personally, I believe that David was the human instrument of this psalm. Although we can't be dogmatic, the the psalm doesn't state its author. Some believe that it it was actually Ezra. Others even ascribe the psalm to Daniel, but but I hold to Davidic authorship, but but that's really not the important point of this psalm. This psalm is composed of 22 stanzas and and they're they're in, in sections of eight different verses. And each of the 22 stanzas is built on, on one of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. It is powerful in its presentation. Today, we're going to begin with the first of these verses, and then we will spend the majority of time on the last of the verses from this psalm, really looking at the bookends of Psalm 119. Your Bibles are open to Psalm 119. Verse number one says this, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Now pause here for just a moment. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Now let me ask you about your personal experience. How many of you have had this uninterrupted forward march throughout the course of your Christian experience? How many of you have never had a moment where you felt like you did in some way, shape, or form lose control of the vehicle? And now instead of, instead of driving forward in a sense, you're going backwards. It's like, what in the world just happened? But blessed, the word carries the idea of, oh, the happiness many times over. There's some overflow of joy that comes from my walk in relationship with God. And he sem- simply says, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. That is a beautiful, powerful truism. It, it's true. But has that been your exclusive experience in your Christian walk, if you know Christ personally? Fast forward I know we do some disservice to the psalm, but fast forward to the last verse of Psalm 119. After the author gives us one of the most beautiful pictures of the commandments of God and the blessing that comes to those who walk in light of those commandments, we find at the very end of Psalm 119, the last verse where the author says, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. In a sense, it is presenting the definition of one that we at times refer to as a backslider. One who has gone astray. Now, the options for direction today are limited In fact, they are isolated to only two. You and I, in our Christian experience, I'm speaking to those who have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Sometimes we refer to them as the saved. That is, they're saved from the consequence of hell because of a relationship with Jesus Christ, allowing Christ to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. You know you are purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. He bought you and and then birthed you into his family. I'm speaking to this group. 
We know that, that I am walking with God, but at times we seem to go in the other direction. And again, there are only two. Either I am advancing in my Christian walk, I am growing, or I am going backwards in the same. We at times like to kid ourselves by saying, well, I'm not really going forward. I'm, not, I'm just kind of stationary right now. It simply is not the case. You are either growing in your walk, you are going forward, or you are doing something other than the same. The psalmist here begins by detailing the straying of the sheep. The straying of the sheep. A man named Mike Iaconelli wrote the following regarding backsliding. He said, I live in a small rural community There are lots of cattle ranches around here, and every once in a while, a cow wanders off and gets lost. Ask a rancher how a cow gets lost, and the chances are he will reply, well, the cow starts nibbling on a tuft of green grass, and when it finishes, it looks ahead to the next tuft of green grass and starts nibbling on that one. And then it nibbles on a tuft of grass right next to a hole in the fence. It sees another tuft of green grass on the other side of the fence. So it it nibbles on that one and then goes off to the next tuft. The next thing you know, the cow's nibbled itself into being lost. And then Iaconelli wrote, most people don't deliberately set out to backslide, but following their appetites or desires from one tuft to the next, they nibble themselves through the fence. You know, the little tufts of green grass when on the other side of the fence are the challenges that we all face. How often do we come to the conclusion that yes, in fact, I do believe the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. And then it begins to captivate our attention. And and now we begin to think, what would it be like to just taste a little nibble of the grass on the other side of the fence. This is the continual battle that every believer faces. And I wanna repeat that. This is the continual battle, emphasis on the word every believer. If you know Christ personally, this is not just my battle. It's not just the battle of Dr. Zacharias. It's not just the battle of your, your children. It is every person's continual battle. In Psalm 19, verse number 13, the the psalmist wrote, keep back thy servant. He says, hold back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression, the presumptuous sins. These are the little tufts of grass that are so close to the fence. They're the ones that we think we can handle. Seriously, we say, it's no big deal. And then they lead us from one no big deal to the next and to the next and so on. They're the easy sins. They really take no effort and no thought at all. And after all, who doesn't do what I'm doing? I'm no different than them. Did you ever... Did you ever climb up the slide when you were a kid? Did you ever, you know, like you've slid down it a thousand times, but did you ever just climb up the slide? Do you know climbing up the slide took effort that coming down the slide never demands? To go up it, you're gonna have to wiggle your way up, but sometimes you have to wedge your feet on either side of the slide, depending on how steep it is. But to go up the slide certainly was a different matter than going down the slide. Yesterday, we enjoyed hosting as a church the food truck festival. And we had several, you know, people from our community, lots of folks came and it was a great day. For children, we had a lot of different things set up for them to enjoy. So a lot of inflatables, bounce houses, and and right in the middle of a couple of the inflatables was a large inflatable slide. And it looked like fun. Now I didn't slide down the slide, but I watched a lot of people who did. 
And of course, I was, I was talking to some of the children and um, that were riding on the slide. And man, to a, a child that is, you know, this tall, just a small little child, to look at that slide seems like it is mammoth. It's huge. And there was a very small child. I, I, it may have been his first big slide. And he went down the slide and I asked him, I said, hey, what did you do today? He said, I went down the slide. I said, how was it? He said, I didn't like it. <laughs> well, he was, he was nervous. This is a frightening thing. But you've been down a slide, right? How much effort does it take to go down the slide? I mean, seriously, I'm not being silly. You, you know, it just takes a nudge. It just, it just takes a little movement. And then you are carried along by something that you don't have to work to do. All I did is, in a sense, I opened the door for gravity to actually do its thing. And I have slid from one point that takes effort to get to, to another point that takes literally no effort to get to. We have to recognize that no person has ever slid into Christ likeness. No person has ever just slid into a likeness of Jesus. There is something that takes me from point A. This is who I am, am currently all by myself. God, would you do a work in me? And may I continually submit myself to that work, saying no to something that is easy and yes to something that is transformative. That's the background for the, the last verse of this psalm. A verse that comes almost as a shock because there's nothing quite like it anywhere else in the psalm. A confession that in spite of all that's gone on before, he has now gone astray. He says it very directly, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. There are some, and I, I read several, there are some who try to rationalize this passage saying, well, well, he can't be talking about his own personal sin or straying. He, he's probably saying, I'm not, I'm not walking with the Lord enough or I don't love the commandments as much as, don't try to make anything out of this psalm other than what the psalmist says. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. By the way, I might note that backsliding is not possible for a lost person. It is that which occurs to the child of God. The Christian then longs for the right, continually desires to be restored to the ways of righteousness. If that is the case, why do we stray? And why then as Christians do sometimes we continue to live in the far country? In, in Pensacola, we have most of us seen the results of what takes place in a hurricane. We've lived through them. We've experienced them. One of the things that we oftentimes see is we see the, the, the devastation that takes place to the landscape. Of course, there are things that take place with houses and businesses and structures. But one of the things that we just see like, oh, wow, you can't just regrow that so quickly is the damage done to trees. Have you ever done a little further investigation? Because oftentimes we say, wow, look at the damage that the wind caused. But have you ever seen this? I know it's not this way all the time, but, but, but some trees make it, right? I mean, not every tree is, is laid waste. I know that, that this is not a perfect illustration, but it is interesting to me, why do some make it and some do not? Many times, not always, but many times upon further investigation, you look at the tree and have you ever noticed that which was not visible externally with the tree, but when you see that tree is sometimes broken over and also then broken open, you notice that there was something taking place in the core of the tree that actually began to compromise the strength of the tree from the inside that eventually shows itself when the pressures, so to speak, of life come that now reveal itself. God's children have a constant battle that is an internal fight. It is a war that rages between what we refer to as the flesh and the spirit. And when I say spirit, I'm talking about capital S spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. 
The Bible says it this way in Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse number 16. This I say then, walk in the capital S spirit. Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against. Okay, the flesh lusteth against the spirit. That's what he says. That phrase lusteth against means it has desires that are against the spirit. What my flesh desires has nothing to do with what it wants. It has nothing to do with what the spirit of God wants. These two are incompatible and constantly at war. He goes on, he says, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. In other words, this is, this is a constant battle that rages within. They're battling one against the other. As Paul put it, they are contrary. And not until we get a completely new body will this battle with sin come to its conclusion. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. So because this is a battle, Christians do, Christians do sometimes stray. I think at times we might be a little quick to say, well, that person, they're, they're not saved. Because we see them doing things that was our former, as the Bible says, our former conversation, our former lifestyle. So we, we come to a conclusion, well, they must not be saved. Do Christians do those things that sometimes we say, that's inconsistent with who you are. Paul said, ye were sometimes darkness. You used to be darkness. He said, hey, walk as children of light. What he's saying is, stop living like the person you are no longer. Live like who you are. Do Christians backslide? Well, only Christians backslide. And do at times Christians live like, oh, they've gone astray. Yes, they do. But he doesn't stop there. The psalmist details the straying of the sheep. Notice what he gets to next. He gets to the praying of the servant. The straying of the sheep. Now he goes to the praying of the servant. He says again, he says, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. And now look at his prayer. Seek thy servant. Seek thy servant. Do you know what he's saying? If we put it in our vernacular, he's saying, God, Please come after me. God, I know, I, I know I've gone astray like a lost sheep. God, shepherd, would you come after me? Have you ever watched a little child when they, when they want to play and they want you to chase them? How many of you have ever gotten into that game with a child? By the way, it's the never-ending game, okay? So if you're going to play it, get ready for a couple years, all right? So... They, they start to run, and then they look at you like, hey, are you going to come after me? And then so you start to run after them a little bit, and, and they scream and holler, and then they stop and they look, are you going to come after me? They want you to chase them. They act like they're trying to get away from you, but they really, they, they want you to come after them. It's no game. But for the one who said, I I'm like a sheep that has gone astray. God, sheep don't know how to find their way back home. Sheep need a shepherd to bring them back into the fold. And I'm, I'm asking you, would you come after me? I think there are many people, and sometimes more than we may realize, who are actually hoping that someone would come after them. They're Christians. That they would say, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. But do you know what they're doing? They're actually hoping, desiring that someone would pursue them. That, that God would send some instrument of his choosing to say, all right, I'm here. Come on, let's walk back into the fold. Do you know someone who may be acting out and in some way and you wonder what are they doing and why are they acting as they do? Is it possible that they are hoping for the attention of someone to come after them? 
Have you ever found yourself wandering from God and deep within there's some faint desire, some inner longing, some hoping that someone would come after you? How many parents are there that have been hoping and longing and praying that someone would go after their wayward child? Or how many children have been praying that someone would come after their wayward parents? How many have prayed for friends and loved ones that have strayed? Lord, surround them, would you, with salt and light. All we, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord hath laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. I know that the passage is speaking first and foremost to the lost, but believers also go astray. And the psalm before us today is the prayer of a follower of God. He was a believer. You study this psalm, look, you see his love for the law. Psalm 119, verse 97, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Verse 103, how sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. This, this psalmist loved the law. Look at his love for the law. Look at his life of prayer. Verse 145, I cried with my whole heart, hear me, O Lord. I will keep thy statutes. I cried unto thee, save me. I shall keep thy testimonies. I prevented the dawning of the morning. He says, listen, I'm up before the sun rises. I cried, I hoped in thy word. We, we see his love for the law, his life of prayer. We see his lips of praise. Verse number 164, seven times a day do I praise thee because of thy righteous judgments. We see his living obedience. I have kept thy testimonies, verse number 22. Verse 102, I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. Who is this guy? This guy is a person. He, he, we see his love for the law, his life of prayer, his lips of praise, his living obedience. The author of this psalm knew what it meant to walk with God. But he went astray. The battle of going backwards will not end until this life, this journey ends. Perhaps this is why the verse comes last. After all his success, the battle for holiness goes on. He went astray like a lost sheep and was asking the shepherd to find him. Who doesn't love a, a story of reunion and restoration? We love those stories. They, they, they compel us. They engage us. We, we resonate with these stories of reunions. So sometimes we, we hear about a, a lost cat or a lost dog or some pet that, that's been near and dear to the family. I read a news article about a, a Labrador retriever um, named, uh, named Murphy. And Murphy was the with the family. They were out camping and and somehow Murphy was lost while the family's out camping. They searched for him, they put up flyers everywhere, but to no avail, Murphy was not found. Murphy was gone for two years. And someone who knew of the lost dog was camping in an area and saw a dog that fit the description of Murphy. Had been living out in the, the wilderness for two years contacted the family. The family came out to the campsite. Of course, they couldn't find the dog, but they brought the dog's blanket and they brought some, some objects from the family. And they put the dog's blanket out next near to this campsite and they had a ball cap that was there. That night, Murphy came out of the wilderness. He curls up on his blanket and he lays his head on the ball cap that's there. And the person that was out there camping was able to leash the dog and return the dog to the family. There was, they said the person who found the dog said everybody was crying. You know, the family's all crying. I think the dog was crying. I mean, everybody is crying. <laughs> well, why, why is everyone so, so moved by this? Because we love stories of restoration. We, we like it when, when the, 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 the home that I have been separated from, I'm back together again. We want to go home. Or we say, well, I never had that kind of home. Yeah, but you long for it. Well, I never had that kind of a place that I, I know, but there's something deep within that says, oh, but I desire it. Maybe, Lord, maybe I'm never going to experience that until I get to my ultimate home. But Lord, there's something about it that I long for. 
You know, for the dog, it was, it was probably the scent of home. It was faint. It was n- not anything that was so obvious, but it was there. And, and the dog picked up on something of home that, that triggered within him. I know that. In the life of a believer who has gone astray, I, I'm the straying sheep. There is also something about this praying servant that says, I know home and I desire it again. The the unique thing about sheep is that they must be sought, found, and returned. The Hebrew word for lost here, it's an interesting word. It means, it carries the idea, the, the word for lost, it means perish. I'm, I'm like a dying sheep. Lord, I, I, if, if you don't do something for me, I can't do this for myself. I have no ability. Listen, I can't save me. I can't fix me. But I know something's broken, and I'm coming to the person who can. Matthew Henry said, by going astray, we lose the comfort of the green pastures and expose ourselves to a thousand mischiefs. By wandering, we lose the protection of the shepherd, the happiness and comfort of his presence, the peace that is to be ours to enjoy when we find ourselves in the sheepfold. I've lost something, Lord. And the psalmist just acknowledges it. He's not so bound by all that he has said 175 verses of his walk with God, of the power of the word of God, how he desires it all day long. And then he comes to the conclusion of all of it. And he says, listen, maybe what God is saying is, listen, the psalmist is just like you. We're all the same. He's no different. Don't place him the psalmist, don't place him on some pedestal that says, oh, well, I know I struggle, but, but certainly the person who was the instrument, the pen of these words, not him. And God says, yes, him. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant. God, please come after me. You may be asking, well, what is the saint's assurance of God's willingness to seek him? I mean, how do we know that he's even interested in coming after one like me? And I would say, well, just start to think about his promises. How does he, how does he reveal himself to us? In Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 4, the Bible says, What man of you having an hundred sheep? If you lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. We see the straying of the sheep, the praying of the servant. And let's look lastly at the pondering of the saint. The pondering of the saint. Again, verse 176, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant. And here's his pondering. For I do not forget thy commandments. Lord, there is something about your word that I do not forget. They are still present with me. Sometimes we, we, we look again at, at Proverbs, like Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. In other words, he can't get away from those commandments. Those commandments follow hard after him. And that's what I believe the psalmist here is saying. I do not forget your commandments. Lord, they're still present with me. I know what it's like to walk with you. I know your nature and your character. And I know it's consistent of you. To come after one like me. In Ezekiel chapter 34, notice how the the Lord as the shepherd is revealed. Ezekiel 34 beginning in verse 11. For thus saith the Lord God, behold, I, even I will both search my sheep and seek them out. As the shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep 
and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. What was he pondering? I think he's pondering words that he may well have written. The Lord is my shepherd. And I know what kind of shepherd he is. Question, do you have a longing still? Even in a situation, a setting that is gone backwards, not at the place where you once were in your walk with him. Do you find that there is still within you some longing after God, a desire still to walk with him, even though you may have wandered from the commandments that you still know, even those who through grace are mindful of their duty, cannot but own that they have in many instances wandered from it. When speaking to his disciples, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I wonder, Campus Church, if at this very moment there are some who cannot hear the voice of the good shepherd that is calling your name with an understanding that even at this moment, there is one who is seeking after you. The psalmist recognized the need of a higher power to remove him from the error of his ways. Should you come today and actually offer and utter the prayer of the psalmist, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. A man named F.W. Norwood wrote, life's greatest tragedy, life's greatest tragedy is to lose God and not miss him. Oh God, would you keep us from a place where, where we could be so deceived that we, we are separated from you. But do not miss the voice of the shepherd. Do you miss God today? If you have wandered away, I promise you, he misses you. Father, thank you for simple passages of scripture that are so straightforward that they don't try to, to gloss over the reality of our challenge. And a psalmist who so powerfully penned truths about the beauty of your word, the power of you, also comes to a place where he acknowledges the weakness of self. Lord, may we never come to the place where where we have in some way, shape, or form lost our walk with you and not missed you. May we listen today, block out the noise, the distraction, sometimes the confusion or the questions, and, and simply listen to and listen for the voice of a good shepherd who is calling us back to himself. Lord, May we ask, as did the psalmist, acknowledge, I've gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord as we've discovered answers to life's questions from God's Word. Messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV or find us on YouTube by searching Rejoice in the Lord. Your financial support is vital to keep Rejoice on the air. Your tax-deductible gift enables this viewer-supported ministry to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus, this is Rejoice in the Lord.
Rejoice in the Lord celebrates 40 years of telecasting the gospel worldwide because of your support. As a small way of saying thank you, we would love to send you our 2022 Rejoice in the Lord prayer calendar. You're invited to pray daily for Rejoice in the Lord and use this calendar as a reminder to make each day count for eternity. Your generous tax-deductible gift before the end of the year will help Rejoice stay on the air in your area. Ask for the Rejoice prayer calendar when you call, write, or visit us online.